In 27 BC, the Roman Republic, long a decayed and dying institution, was taken out back and shot in the head by Augustus, who ushered in the age of the emperors. Across the centuries-long history of the empire, Rome had many powerful women. The various imperial dynasties were awash with the intrigues of figures such as Livia and Agrippina, but almost no empresses in their own right. In most cases, their influence was often constricted to influencing their husbands or behind-the-scenes dealings. Not surprisingly, this restriction on power was due to the Romans' uniquely rigid misogyny. In the days of the Republic, female members of a family were treated more like chess pieces than people. They were used to facilitate inter-family alliances and could be dropped and divorced at will. Women were expected to be matronly, virtuous, temperate, and above all obedient. Power was to be denied at all costs. To quote Cicero himself, What an appalling business it would be were women to seize control of what are properly exclusive to men, the Senate, the Army, the Magistracies. Cicero's wailing was the prevailing view of Roman moralists. Vicious though it was, it would not be shaken any time soon. Indeed, with Augustus now ensconced atop the throne of the world, it was a view he was keen to enforce. He may be known today as Rome's first emperor, but he made sure to continue the facade of the Republic, in order to paint himself as the staunch protector of Roman traditions. The rigid ideals of Roman public life and service were therefore preserved. The emperor held various republican offices and was known as the princeps civitatis, or the first citizen. Women were strictly prohibited from public office, and since the emperorship was technically veiled in the republican traditions, the chances of women serving as an emperor in the first centuries of the empire were, more so than in ordinary monarchies, incredibly low. To be precise, they were exactly zero. Overt power escaped women for the time being, so now we must look forward a few centuries. The empire was aging and, as the Severan dynasty collapsed in the 3rd century, Rome suffered a particularly nasty midlife crisis. The crisis brought with it many changes to the empire, but there are two that we are interested in. Firstly, it might have actually brought Rome's first empress. After the death of Chad Emperor Aurelian in AD 275, his wife, Ulpia Severina, may have ruled in her own right for several months, with extant coins showing only her face. No literary source mentions her rule, however, so in light of the murky info, this video will not be focusing on her. The second change was more ideological. Diocletian conducted many overhauls to the apparatus of Roman power in order to see it survive the coming centuries. Among these, he also changed the way in which the imperial office was viewed. Diocletian imported many ideas of kingship from the east. Gone were the days when the emperors pandered to the republican ideals of the senate. Instead, Diocletian laid bare the fact that he was, in essence, a king. Diocletian hardly started this process though. The crisis of the 3rd century had seen dozens of so-called barracks emperors rise to power through force of arms alone, and the ideological authority of the Senate was greatly reduced. The emperor was no longer known as the princeps civitatis, the first citizen. Instead, he took the address of dominus, or lord. Now, in no way did the Romans become any more tolerant or progressive than before. The point I'm labouring to get across here is that under the Principate of Augustus, the office of emperor was shaped to an extent by the stern ideals of Roman traditionalism and republicanism, but the dominate of Diocletian, shaped as it was by the more oriental ideas of monarchy, was slowly acknowledging that the Roman Republic was in fact an autocratic monarchy, and monarchies naturally put incredible weight on the bloodlines of a person, trumping even that person's gender. Women's chances had therefore gone up, from nothing to extremely low. Random chance could now see a Roman woman inherit power should she have no brothers, nephews or cousins in sight. But it would not be random chance that brought the first Roman, or to be more precise Eastern Roman, Empress to the throne. The 8th century was a dark time for the Eastern Roman Empire. In 717, the high tide of Islamic power was reached when the Caliphate besieged Constantinople with roughly 100,000 men. For 13 months, bitter fighting raged around the city, but ultimately, like a great wave breaking itself upon a cliff, the siege was broken through a mix of Greek fire, intervention of the Bulgar Khan, and blood, sweat and tears. Since the dark days of the siege, however, things had been on the up for the Eastern Romans. Mere months prior to the siege, power had been usurped by Leo III, and ever since, his Syrian dynasty had brought a measure of peace and stability to the war-torn empire. Some three decades on from that siege, in 754, Irene Sarantapakaina was born in the city of Athens. The city had once been one of antiquity's greatest, but by now it was a relatively backwater town in the backwater that was Byzantine Greece. 
her family was also one of only regional importance. Nobody could have anticipated the heights to which she would one day rise, and the lows to which she would fall. Our knowledge of her childhood is murky at best, but while we don't know the details about her formative years, we do know the kind of person she became. She was intelligent, driven, and a formidably shrewd political operator, but, as time would soon tell, almost pathologically ambitious. Constantinople would suit her down to the ground. With scant details about her early life, our story really starts in 769, when she was probably 15 years old. For it was in that year that a ship carrying the young Irene swept across the Aegean Sea and carried her to Constantinople. When she arrived in the great city, she was greeted with pomp and ceremony, and was warmly welcomed by the leading members of the aristocracy. This was a day of great importance for the Byzantines, for she was to marry the son and heir of Emperor Constantine V, a man called Leo the Khazar. As with so much else in her early life, we don't know precisely why she was picked, but she was apparently quite beautiful. The marriage took place on the 17th of December, and the young couple, happily married, soon produced a son in 771. They named him Constantine after his grandfather. The Syrian dynasty was secured for another generation. Or so it seemed. After a long and successful reign of 34 years, old Emperor Constantine V died in 775, to be succeeded by Leo IV. The Khazar proved to be slightly more easygoing than his father, but was nevertheless a chip off the old block, leading a successful invasion of the Abbasid Caliphate in 778. Unfortunately, Leo suffered from tuberculosis, and that proved to be a battle he couldn't win. He died in 780, after just five years in power. Irene was now left as regent for the nine-year-old Constantine VI. For the next two decades, Irene would wield incredible influence, first as regent, then as empress. To say that her time at the top would be interesting is an understatement. Her reign would be marked out by many landmark events, religious controversies, heinous crimes, dynastic infighting, and, most famously, the rise of an empire. All that, however, was still far over the horizon. For now, the Eastern Romans were busy playing at their favourite hobby, fighting over the succession. Leo the Khazar was not Constantine V's only son. He had five others. They were all ambitious and all eager to try their luck. Old Constantine had confirmed that the empire would go solely to Leo IV, but Leo's early death had left the young Constantine VI exposed to the intrigues of his uncles. Luckily for him, Irene had clearly been making quiet notes during her first 11 years at the capital on how to rule. She would prove to be a hard-nosed and driven politician. If they thought that they would enjoy a walkover, then they had gravely underestimated her mettle. Shortly into Constantine VI's reign, Irene got word of a planned putsch against her and her son. More worryingly still, many high-ranking officials were implicated in the plot. The brothers planned to elevate the eldest of them, Nikephorus, to the throne, but the empress acted decisively, and many of those implicated were exiled. For the brothers themselves, however, Irene had a different punishment in mind. All five were ordained as clerics in the church, meaning they could not marry. Then, on Christmas Day, she had them serve her and Constantine during the church services. For a haughty noble of imperial blood, few great humiliations could be imagined, and Irene, with a key understanding of court ceremony and a cool life for politics, had dramatically reinforced her position. As Irene put the plots behind her and dealt with the conspirators, she could finally turn her eyes to governance. Constantine was barely ten, and a regency council had to be set up with Irene at its head. Eunuchs were no strangers to the Byzantine court, but Irene came to have a particular reliance on them to fill administrative roles. At the Byzantine court, only eunuchs were trusted with attending to empresses and princesses, so Irene will have built up a trusted ring of eunuch attendants that she brought with her to the business of government. 782 would prove to be a year of mixed fortunes for Byzantium. In the west, Irene initiated negotiations for a Frankish bride for Constantine VI, which would be crucial in ensuring peaceful relations with the rapidly rising Franks. In the east, meanwhile, she had to fend off an Arab attack. Conflict had flared up the year before, but 782 would see a disastrous Arab invasion that marched all the way to the Bosphorus. She put her chief minister, the eunuch Staurakios, in charge of the army but the generals of Anatolia disliked the presence of the eunuch, and one of them defected to the Arabs. The situation was only salvaged with the payment of an eye-watering war indemnity. Staurakios' poor performance did nothing to damage his standing in the eyes of Irene, and he was sent on a large-scale raid into Slavic Greece. In this he was more successful, and returned to the capital in triumph. In the aftermath of this success, 
Irene and Constantine led an imperial procession through Thrace and Macedonia in 784, refortifying cities on the frontier and strengthening the empire's foothold in the Balkans. So far, so good. Yes, the Arab War had been a failure, but otherwise Irene's regency had performed well. Now though, the Empress decided upon a course of action that was on a far more universal, sweeping scale. The restoration of icons. The Eastern Romans were currently embroiled at this time in iconoclasm, which in Greek means icon smashing. It was a doctrine that rejected pictorial descriptions of God and Jesus as unholy. The Pope firmly rejected iconoclasm, and it had resulted in quite a major breach between East and West. Irene, for her part, had been an iconoclast from birth, but she never held particularly strong convictions either way. Instead, she viewed the restoration of icons as a way to reunite the church and improve relations with the West. This follows pretty naturally from her pursuit of a marriage with the daughter of the Frankish king. The Empress knew that she would have to tread carefully. Iconoclasm was deeply embedded in the East, and much of the army was made of iconoclasts. She made her first move in 784, when Patriarch Paul IV suddenly resigned. Patriarchs were expected to die in office, but Paul protested illness, and furthermore, he proclaimed ringingly that he didn't truly believe in iconoclasm, and wished to repent before he died. There's a whiff of stage management around all this, and the man she selected as his successor, Tarasios, was a layman, but Irene swiftly had him promoted through the church hierarchy, and the freshly minted patriarch Tarasios declared that he could not bear to preside over a church that was in schism. Iconoclasm would have to be reversed. Irene was only too happy to oblige. So it was that in 786, delegates from all over the Christian world, even in the lands conquered by the Caliphate, assembled in Constantinople. The Pope sent two delegates, and the Empress gave them precedence over the rest. But Irene had underestimated the pushback against their new policies, and as the council was beginning, a group of disgruntled iconoclast soldiers burst in and threatened to kill Tarasios. The council dispersed, and Irene was left to pick up the pieces. She announced a new campaign against the Arabs, and the iconoclast troops in the capital were transferred over to Asia, where they were abruptly disbanded and told to go home. The families of the soldiers were still stuck in the capital, so the troops had little choice but to disband peacefully, after which they were dispersed and their families were sent back to them. In their place she put loyal troops. The council would be back on, and this time there would be no interruptions. This time it would be held in the city of Nicaea. This was where Constantine I had held the first ecumenical council back in 325, and her choice was rich in symbolism. Now, once again, another emperor by the name of Constantine was in town to restore religious orthodoxy. Irene herself drew parallels with St. Helena, Constantine I's famous mother. The papal delegates had only made it to Sicily when they were called back to the eastern capital, and soon the work began apace. I won't bore you with the details, but in short, icons were restored and the iconoclast bishops were granted amnesty. A grand victory for Irene indeed. She and Constantine were hailed as the second Helena and Constantine I. The Christian church was once again united. The Eastern Empire was no longer a heretical outcast. Yet as the moment of her greatest triumph passed, things began to go wrong, and a lot of the blame must fall at Irene's feet. By 790, Constantine VI was 19, more than old enough to rule on his own, but Irene resisted any attempts to pry her away from power. She had proven herself far-sighted and wise so far, and if she had just allowed Constantine to rule, with her at his side to temper his inexperience, then the following struggles could have been avoided. Instead, she allowed her crippling ambition to lead her to disaster. A disaster for her, for her family, and for her empire. Events finally came to a head in 790. In the preceding years, Irene's generals had overseen military defeats in Europe and Asia, while a rise in tensions with the Franks had led to a poorly advised attack on the Frankish vassal in Benevento, which also ended in disaster. With her position weakened, Constantine tried to assert his control by arresting the eunuch Staurakios, Irene's chief minister. The Empress struck back and had Constantine arrested along with his entourage. The first round of conflict between mother and son had run its course, and Irene had seemingly emerged victorious. But dissatisfied rumblings in the army began to spill out into open defiance, and most of the Anatolian troops refused to swear the oath of allegiance to Irene. They recognised only one ruler, and that was Constantine VI. Faced with this insurmountable opposition, the young emperor was soon sprung from jail, and the empress was forced to admit defeat. She was then confined to a lonesome palace in Constantinople. So then, that was that. Constantine had won. He enjoyed the support of much of the military, and even those who supported Irene couldn't really argue with the legitimacy of his rule. 
but all those who saw in him the next glorious generation of the Syrian dynasty would soon be massively let down. For it soon became clear to all that the young emperor had inherited none of his mother's intelligence, and even less of her backbone. In the first two years, his reign saw defeats against the Arabs, to whom Constantine was forced to pay an eye-watering tribute, and then he was personally defeated by the Bulgars in 792. Earlier that year, he had also made the fateful decision to reintroduce his mother into courtly life, allowing her influence to seep back into the establishment. Although he didn't know it yet, it was quite literally his fatal mistake. But while it may have been his greatest mistake, it was certainly not his last. He got word of another conspiracy involving his uncles, although this time it only involved one of them. Nikephorus, once again, tried his hand at usurpation, only to be quickly captured and blinded. Constantine sent word that the other four uncles should have their tongues cut out. The disproportionate cruelty with which he dealt with his uncles tarnished his image, and his habitual cruelty would constantly ebb away at his public support. Back in 788, in the face of growing hostility with the Franks, Irene shelved her plans to marry Constantine to a Frankish princess. Instead, he was married to Maria of Amnia, a beautiful but otherwise unnoteworthy Byzantine noblewoman. The young emperor had not been very pleased with the change of plans, and now that he was in control, he quickly began to look for a replacement. In 795, he finally divorced Maria and forced her to become a nun, remarrying in short order to a court lady called Theodote. The patriarch Tarasios gave his belated approval to the union, but if Constantine thought that the rest of the church would step in line, then he had made a grave mistake. Second and third marriages were viewed as highly sacrilegious in Byzantium, especially since his first wife was still alive. Much of the church disowned Tarasios for allowing the second marriage to go ahead, and what became known as the Moikian controversy led to Constantine losing the support of the church. Moikian comes from the Greek word moikeia, which means adultery. The harsh treatment of those who opposed him only made the situation worse. The union produced a son, Leo, in October 786. Cruel, weak, inept, and now downright sacrilegious, Constantine VI soon found the number of his supporters dwindling by the day, while his mother, coolly eyeing up the changing winds, found her power base strengthening. In all fairness, the emperor did lead a few successful campaigns against the Bulgars and Arabs, but these were overshadowed by his growing unpopularity. Irene had never quite forgiven her son for ousting her, and as 786 gave way to 787, his position looked precarious indeed. Then, in May 787, tragedy struck. The baby Leo died aged just seven months. He was buried in a tiny marble sarcophagus. The emperor was struck hard by the loss, but this would not be the last of his miseries. Even in the depth of his grief, he slowly became aware of the danger that he was in. Nothing could be conclusively proven, but ominous reports filtered in of an imminent coup, with his mother getting special mentions. In his hour of need, he found his support lacking. He had alienated so much of his power base that he no longer felt safe in the capital. Irene, meanwhile, had bribed or otherwise successfully convinced most of the empire's top generals that Constantine was leading their country into the ground. It was time for new management. The emperor tried to flee the capital, but Irene's men captured him, and he was dragged back. The wretched emperor was then taken to the Porphyra. This was the special birthing chamber for the imperial family, lined with the purple porphyry which gave it its name. It was in that room that Irene had given birth to Constantine 26 years earlier, and it was in that room that she ordered his eyes to be gouged out. Some sources say that his blinding was done in such a way as to ensure his death, while others say that he lingered on until 805, but the result, ultimately, is the same. Blinding was a common punishment in Byzantium for political opponents, with it being considered more humane than the death penalty. But to blind and possibly murder your own child... This certainly marks the peak of Byzantine cruelty, and the bloody pinnacle of human ambition. Irene of Athens, at the age of 43, was now the first empress regnant in the Roman Empire's 824-year history thus far. Now, I'm no PR expert, but killing your children is generally a bad look. Irene's position was still insecure, and her popularity permanently plummeted after the downfall of Constantine, so she took measures to try and increase her popularity among the people. Taxes were slashed wherever she could find them, and certain tariffs were removed. Adding to her problems was the war she had inherited with the Arabs. The Caliph, Harun al-Rashid, had launched another devastating invasion of the empire, and Irene's forces were swiftly routed. She was forced to pay a humiliating indemnity for him to leave, further impoverishing the empire. With dissatisfaction beginning to bubble under the surface, 
Irene now began to alienate her oldest and arguably most trusted supporters, the eunuchs. Irene, childless and by now in her mid-forties, presented these eunuchs with a unique opportunity, and her two most prominent eunuchs, Staurakios and Aetios, tried to snap it up quick. If either Staurakios or Aetios could convince the Empress to marry or adopt one of their respective family members as her successor, then they would be well placed for the next reign. Frustratingly for them, however, Irene refused to marry or to adopt anyone into the Imperial family, for she knew that the second she did, she would be fighting them for control, just like how it had been with Constantine VI. As a result, the eunuchs gradually came to support her less and less, as they now saw that she would never grant the Emperorship to either of their families. For Irene, this was really an unsolvable situation. If she pandered to one, she would antagonise the other, but she was sort of asking it by blinding her own son. The rivalry between Staurakios and Aetios only grew more heated as the question of the next Roman Emperor became more hotly contested. But then, all of a sudden, that question was seemingly answered for them. Staurakios died in 800, but Aetios had little time to gloat. For in the early months of 801, shocking news washed over the Empire. News that would change the world, and irrevocably reshape the face of Europe. On Christmas Day, AD 800, Pope Leo III had crowned Charlemagne as Emperor of the Romans in Rome. The reasons for this are complex, but by this point Leo III saw the Franks as far more reliable protectors of the papacy than the Eastern Romans, and he likely saw this coronation as a way of improving papal prestige. Furthermore, the fact that Irene was a woman invalidated her rule in the eyes of Frankish Salic law. The throne of the Romans was vacant, and who better to fill it than the Franks themselves? Naturally, the news was greeted with outrage in Constantinople, and the indignation only became more fierce when missives arrived from Charlemagne, asking for Irene's hand in marriage. This imperial marriage is a very interesting what-if scenario. Unfortunately, I think that if it had taken place, it would have just been an utter disaster. Check this video's description for a fuller explanation on why. Most revoltingly to the snobbish Byzantines, the Empress didn't seem wholly perturbed by the idea of an imperial marriage, but the plan was eventually derailed by Aetios, who stood to lose influence in the event of any marriage. By 802, Irene had reached the end of the road. Military defeat and financial ruin was quickly overrunning the Empire. The dissatisfaction of the eunuchs was enhanced by a wider dissatisfaction among the generals, who were tired of eunuchs taking up so many key appointments, and the stain of Constantine's demise proved to be impossible to wash away. The eunuch Aetios, one of her closest advisers, saw no future in Irene, and decided to get a stake in the next regime. He convinced the finance minister, a stern man named Nikephorus, to claim the throne. He was only too happy to oblige. One day, troops burst into the palace and arrested the empress. Yet Irene was calm and reserved. She made no protest and betrayed no signs of fear. Instead, she accepted responsibility for her actions, and said that it was God's will that had brought her to power. Now God had simply seen fit to raise up another. For all her faults, Irene had clearly mastered the art of the dignified exit. In her place, Nikephorus was raised to the purple. Isolated and alone, defeated for the last time, the old empress was banished to the island of Lesbos, where she died only a year later, in 803. Thus perished the first Roman empress ever to rule in her own right. She possessed many of the traits that made for a successful ruler, but I can hardly call her five years on the throne a success. The economy was left in shambles, and the legitimacy of the empire was dealt a permanent blow. Not a great way to end. But then again, that shouldn't surprise us. In disposing of her own son in such a wretched way, her ambition led her into a corner from which she could not escape. Deservedly unpopular, and thus forced to bribe the people and ruin the economy, and also lacking an heir, and thus unable to provide stability or continuity. By the end, she was inescapably trapped in an ever-changing web of intrigue of her own making, as her eunuchs schemed to place their own men on the throne after her. But the failures of her rule shouldn't detract from her otherwise successful regency. When she was protecting her son, she showed her mettle as a tough politician, fending off threats from ambitious relatives and upstart generals alike. The Council of Nicaea and the restoration of icons had been a resounding triumph for Byzantium, healing the breach with the papacy. Unfortunately, even this, her greatest triumph, was not to last. Just 13 years after her deposition, iconoclasm would return, and it would take another three decades to see it off for the final time. In the wake of her downfall, Nikephorus would fix the empire's economy, but the wars with the Arabs and Bulgars continued unsuccessfully, 
and he would be killed on the battlefield by the Bulgars in 811. The tensions with Charlemagne, smouldering ever since his coronation, erupted into all-out war when Venice tried to change allegiance and leave Constantinople's imperial orbit. The war was only ended in 811 with the recovery of Venice, although the Eastern Emperors were obliged to recognise the Franks' title of Emperor. For the first time in a long time, Europe had two empires. Irene's reign was therefore one of Europe's most significant, if not for its success, then solely for its unintended consequences. Anyway, this video is far too long as it stands. Bye.